What's up, everybody? Thanks for joining us, Coffee with Keener, where we take a casual and conversational approach to studying God's Word. We're excited that you're here. Uh, thank you. If you want to get plugged into other episodes or or start following us, you know, check in the description below. There's a link there to our playlist, and uh, we're just really excited. Dr. Keener. Hey, how you doing this morning? What's up, man? All right, I got my uh, my Hope mug again. Oh man, I'm I'm rocking. I'm a we're we're mug collectors, so I got this um, Grand Canyon mug. So we got something from all of our traveling. Wow. Yeah, I don't have that many. I'm gonna <laughs> I'll have to stock up on some new mugs just for these episodes. Switch it between two, right? Yeah. There you go. Well, hey, thanks for joining us again. Just to recap, last episode um, we talked about verses 11 and 12. Just a couple things. You know, we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. That's in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We talked about what they are, you know, what that means for us, and really that those should be a mark of, you know, people seeing how Christians act. And then we really spent a lot of time on the gospel, which we were super excited about, just talking about what that message is and what that message means for us. And really, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, really outlines that. You know, Jesus lived this perfect life, died, buried, resurrected again, forgives our sins, and we're all saved. That kind of a, a quick cliff note of the gospel. But those verses are, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, really depict that. So check that out. But that was fun, Dr. Keener, talking about oh, the man, that was, message. That was one of my favorite. I say that about them all, but that was one of my yeah. favorite episodes. Yeah, yeah. So we are yeah. trying to talk about that. Because it's so cool. important. People got to get the gospel and understand yeah. Jesus, you know, that, yeah. that's it, you know. I mean, that, that's the first step, man, understanding yeah. the gospel message, who Jesus is, you know, what he did for us and his life. That, that's kind of the, the cornerstone of it all. Yeah. And that resurrection, man, that's what it's all about, man. That's, cool. that's the key right there. That's what separates Jesus and the Christian faith from all the others, man. Yeah. He yeah. called it and he did it. He did, man. <laughs> oh, so good. So cool. So that was eleven and twelve. So we're in. We're flipping through Philippians still. Uh, we are in chapter one, and we're going to start with verse thirteen, and then start rolling through there. So let's jump in there. Philippians chapter one, verse thirteen. I'll read it, and then we will uh, start discussing. <clears throat> All right. So thirteen says. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. All right, so here, Paul is talking about what he's doing while he's in prison. And we talked about this idea that, you know, he's on house arrest, not necessarily in a prison like we might think of, um, but there are guards there. So let's just talk about that, his environment, that situation. I know we're going to look at Acts a little bit to help us dive into that too. Yeah, we we've mentioned that Paul was in chains, and we I don't ever I don't think we've ever really talked about why he was in chains. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so 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 quite simply, the reason he was in chains is because he couldn't stop telling people about Jesus. Just couldn't stop, man. No, I, that's a good reason to be in chains, man. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, he he got into trouble in Jerusalem you know, with some of the Jewish religious leaders, and and eventually uh, he is sent to Rome uh, to stand trial. And you can actually read about this in Acts chapter 12, or 21, verse 17, and actually that whole story continues to the end of the book of Acts. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we learn... Um, a lot about his imprisonment. If if we turn to uh, Acts 28 verses 16 through 31, we have a brief account there of of kind of his situation. Uh, yeah. He was under house arrest, as he said. He was living in a rented house. He was in chains. Yeah. He was guarded by a Roman soldier. Um, so it wasn't the worst of conditions. He wasn't in some damp, dark dungeon somewhere, but yeah. But he was on lockdown. Uh, yeah. So uh, it wasn't the best of situations. And if we turn to Acts 28.30, we learn that uh, 
Paul was in Rome in chains uh, for two years. Wow. Yeah, two years. Just awaiting trial. So it was like, wow, two years. Yeah. And it wasn't terrible. Like I said, he was allowed visitors. Uh, and in Acts 28.30, it says that he welcomed all who came to see him. And then in the next verse, verse 31 in Acts 28, uh, points out here how Paul boldly proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the guy gets thrown into prison yeah. for preaching the gospel. And then when he is in prison, what does he do? Preach the gospel. Preaches the gospel. To everyone. To everyone. So uh, not just people like Christians, like these Roman guards. Yeah. We're assuming that he was just talking. I mean, if he's there for two years, right, you'd think he'd build relationships with them and, oh, yeah. and start oh. telling them about Jesus, which is just like wild. Yeah, so anybody who showed up, including the guards. Uh, yeah. And as I thought about this, uh, a verse in 1 Corinthians uh, came to me. Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 16. And, and I think this verse speaks to what we're talking about, how Paul really felt about preaching the gospel. So All 1 right. Corinthians 9, 16. Okay, I'll read that. You got that? Yep, 9, 16 in 1 Corinthians says, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Wow. Two key words, compelled. Yes, compelled. That's huge. Compelled. He was driven, man. It was, it was just like this force driving yeah. him. He like couldn't he, stop. Yeah, he could not, not like he no. had to do it. And then he says, woe to me if I don't preach this gospel. He's like... He's saying to God, man, strike me with, with disease, sickness, distress, grief. Yeah, if I'm not preaching this gospel, man, strike me. You know? yeah. So woe to me, man. Like he knew, his, he knew his purpose. He knew his calling. And if he wasn't doing it, it he, he could not do it. Like he just had to. Yeah. And hey, I wish we had that, that, that desire, yeah. this intense uh yeah. Force driving us to, to preach this gospel. Yeah. Well, I think about that. Like, I know he wasn't in like a prison that we think of, but he's still on house arrest. And, yeah. you know, I don't know. I think if I got thrown in the jail, like, you know, my, I think I would be worried about myself a little bit, except instead of being yeah. like, oh, you know, how can I preach the gospel today to the guards? I'd be like, why, how am I going to get out of here? You know? So just thinking about, his mindset in every environment, in every circumstance, the gospel was number one. Like, wow. that's such a good example of putting Jesus, the gospel, the message above yourself. Because he literally was like, yeah, woe to me. Like, yeah. who cares what happens to me? Like, the message needs to get out. You know, we hear a lot today about living a purpose-driven life. And that's cool. I think life has to have purpose. I'm not saying that's wrong. But, yeah. but I think as we look at Paul here, we could say he lived a gospel-driven life. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And our purpose should be the gospel, so they kind of go hand in hand. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Now, we, we talked about how Paul, you know, preached Christ, the gospel, to everybody God sent his way. Yep. Uh, and clearly, some of those people that God put in his path were Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's talked about here in this verse. The verse mentions palace guards. So just a, a word about the palace guards. They were like the top gun, top notch soldiers, uh, the best of the best. Okay. And, and their primary task was to guard the emperor. Oh, wow. So you can make sh be sure that the, the emperor made sure that the best guys yeah. uh, were in the palace guard. I mean, they were responsible for guarding his life. So he put the best guys there. So these dudes knew what they were doing. They yeah. They were guard. They're yeah. like top gun soldiers, man. They, yeah, they, they were the best. So, yeah. Yeah. Like Navy SEALs or... or SEALs, yeah. yeah, Green Beret, you know. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah, yeah, these are the best guys that Rome has. So 
Um, yeah, and, and there was quite a few of them. Uh, ancient historians tell us that there were about 9,000 wow. of these palace guards, and they actually lived at the palace. So I'm thinking, man, Caesar must have had a pretty big house <laughs> to yeah. be able to house yeah, yeah, all yeah. these guys. Yeah, he uh, was living it up. Yeah, so some of these soldiers then were released from palace guard duty and and um, they went to, to guard Paul. Tip probably only one at a time. Paul wasn't uh, a prisoner they had to worry about. He was a very uh, model prisoner, if you will. Yeah, yeah, he uh, was causing trouble. He just kind of- Yeah, so more than likely, they had one guard at a time. Yeah. Uh, and typically the Roman guard worked a four hour shift. Uh, so I'm assuming that that's kind of what was going on with Paul. He had a Roman guard working four hours, and then another guy would come and replace him, and so on. So, so in a 24-hour period, you know, I, I would guess that Paul saw six different guards. Mm. Uh, now, did the same six guys come back? I don't know. You know, yeah. Let's just say that they switched it up every now and then. Uh, yeah. So, if we do the math, it's possible that that Paul. Uh, was able to share the gospel, build relationships, and share the gospel with with as many as a hundred or more uh, over that period. Yeah, and yeah. we don't know how many. Never says, but we are told in verse thirteen that the word about Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it says, had spread throughout the whole palace guard. Yeah. So everybody in Every Caesar's period. palace, man. Yeah. Uh, heard about Jesus. So so here Paul is in chains, but the gospel is clearly advancing. Yeah. Now Paul's sharing the gospel with every single person God puts in his path. So what, what a great thing that's going on here. Yeah, yeah. And not only like, and then moving into verse 14, this whole idea of him doing this, not only are these people hearing about Jesus, but he's kind of motivating and encouraging the people around him, you know, other Christians outside. Let's read 14 and then talk about that. Okay. You know, his boldness, his, him being courageous really kind of was, you know, contagious. So 14 says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So what, because Paul's doing this, the brothers and sisters, so other Christians, you know, amongst the areas are being like, man, Paul's doing this in chains. Yeah. I, can do, I can do it out here. Oh yeah. So like this, this is like contagious. And I think we see that in today, but let's talk about that idea. I think, you know, being contagious, that boldness. Yeah. I mean, when people heard about Paul's prison ministry, if you will, yeah. so we kind of look at it from a different perspective, but you know, Paul had a prison ministry going on here. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. when, People on the outside heard about that. Man, they just, uh, they got this renewed boldness. Like yeah. you said, if Paul can do it there, man, I can do it where I'm at. And so, yeah. uh, and we need to have that same enthusiasm, I think, to share the gospel. Definitely. Uh, it's the message that saves, man. It's the greatest message on the planet. Yeah. Uh, and even thinking about, like, if you're a Christian in the area and you hear that Paul goes into prison, you, you you might be you might be a little sad like oh man and then in a in a month or so you get word hey man he's preaching the gospel in there like that that would be very encouraging like you know you'd be sad about him going in and then be like ah oh, man but he is he's preaching the message in there so that would be really cool to hear oh yeah it, it makes me think of uh you know what Paul says in Romans eight twenty eight okay uh, he yeah. says and we know that in all things even when I'm in chains in prison, yeah. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Even in man, chains. We got an awesome God, man. He can take any situation and bring good out of it. And yeah. he certainly did that uh, with Paul in this yeah. case. So even chains. What about even uh, coronavirus? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> even that. Yeah. Hey, I, we probably would have started this particular uh, series and, and this uh, 
podcast yeah sometime but being in this situation and being in quarantine it kind of moved us yeah, into absolutely. this so man and we're hearing that god is doing great things uh yeah. through this podcast people are are growing in the faith and hearing about jesus so uh so yeah it, god does awesome stuff man we yeah. have an awesome god yeah so like that is an example and paul's an example like regardless of circumstances regardless of our environments like yeah god's working and you know he's working for the good of everything so it's tough to see that in the midst of things that's what well, i was gonna say it's really easy in retrospect to be like yeah, oh god was working but when you're in the storm man <laughs> it's windy it's rainy it's it is. cold oh yeah when you're there it's okay. not so obvious man. <laughs> but but looking back and you know we could yeah. we could we don't really want to go off on this, but we could cite, I could cite dozens of examples where yeah. you ask why God, and then you look back and say, now I know yeah. why God is, yeah. you use this in a way I never thought you could or would. And, and it's good and, to know uh, those, those stories and examples. So like, even when you are in it, just to bring those up to mind might bring a little comfort. Now it might not bring complete comfort and yeah. take everything away, but it, it can give a little bit of a hope to get through um, i know for me like when i'm going through storms i'm like i try and think about my past storms that now i can look at in a reflective way mm -hmm. so when i'm in this current one i can be like okay i can get through it yeah so, i remember how god has worked in the past that's yeah. what helps us in the present and the future yeah so, amen yeah paul man preaching the gospel encouraging people around him to preach yeah. and then and then 15 through 17 kind of starts talking about other people preaching the gospel. So let's read that because I think that's okay. good to touch on. So I'll do 15 through 17. So it says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. <clears throat> so here we got Paul talking about pe other people preaching Christ out of first, out of goodwill and love. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we need to touch too much on that because they're more or less doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And he talks about these other people who are preaching Christ out of selfish ambition, out of rivalry, envy, um, like, let's dive into that. Like, who are those people? Who, who's he kind of referring to? Do we have that answer? Um, yeah, like this selfish ambition preaching. They're, it's a, you know, still preach about Christ, but they're doing it from a weird motive here. So let's, like, who are those people? Well, let, let's begin by just talking a little bit in, um, in a general way. Uh, what seems to be happening here, this group that's preaching out of envy and selfish ambition, uh, it seems that in one way or another, they're, they're saying bad things about Paul. Uh, and um, maybe they were spinning his in imprisonment in a negative way, saying stuff like, you know, look at this guy. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. in jail. He must be a criminal. You know, you guys shouldn't be following him. Mm -hmm. uh, so that seems to be the spin. Uh, we don't know uh, who exactly these people were. As I've studied this over the years, I've come across three different uh, ideas as to who they might be. So let's we can just run through that real quickly. One idea is that uh, these preachers were unconverted, you know, non-Christian Jewish religious leaders. Okay. And they were just speaking out against yeah. you know, Jesus. And Paul. Yeah. And Paul was a religious Jewish person. Yeah. yeah. There might have been some bad blood there. So, but what actually may have happened here uh, is that by preaching even negatively about Jesus, uh, people got more interested in Jesus. Yeah. Who's this? Who is this guy? Yeah, you're saying all this bad stuff. Well, who yeah. really is this guy? Yeah. And, yeah. So here's how it could have worked out. You know, it started out, they're preaching against Jesus, but what they actually did, you know, they got people to want to know more about Jesus. 
Yeah. And as people learn more about Jesus, some of the people got saved. Wow. So, so, so even though bad, you know, preaching negatively, yeah. uh, you know, God brings good out of it like he yeah. always does. So that was one, one idea. Second view was that uh, these preachers that Paul's talking about may have been uh, converted Jews, converted Jews, Messianic Jews, saved Jews. But even though they knew Christ and you know, were saved, they were focusing way too much on Jewish law and custom okay. and not enough you know, on Jesus and the Christian faith. In essence, they were saying to Gentiles, non-Jews, <laughs> non if, yeah. if you want to get saved, you got to obey the Jewish law and accept Jesus yeah. as Savior and Lord. So twisting it a little bit, holding on to, the Jewish people were holding on to the old customs and telling non-Jewish people, hey, you yeah. got to do this plus Jesus. No, it was okay if the Jews want to continue with some of their customs yeah. and that that was fine. Yeah, yeah. But what they were doing, they were putting that on non-Jews and and Paul, yeah. well, he speaks out against that in some of his other letters. He said, Yeah, man, that's that's wrong, man. It's Jesus. It's it's yeah. not, you know, Judaism and Jesus, it's Jesus, period. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh yeah, so that was that second group. And then there was a third possibility that I've come across saying that these uh, preachers were converted Gentiles. So they, they were Gentiles who were saved. And they were simply trying to gain ground. You know, they knew Paul was out of the picture. You know, he's, he's in prison in Rome. Hey, now it's, it's maybe I can kind of move up the ladder and take over the top spot as the, as the main guy. Yeah. Main preacher. Uh, in the Mediterranean world. They were gifted preachers, yeah. uh, but they spoke negatively about Paul, just hoping to yeah. um, get his supporters. So that's kind of... Which that makes sense. I mean, unfortunately, we see that today, like that, you know, once you kind of get that ego, and in anything, that can even overpower a pastor, you know, thinking... Oh, yeah, it does. Want more people to watch them, and that might be putting someone else down and put you up. So we see that in, in all aspects of our life now. So that, that, you know, that scenario could make, does make sense that it could happen. Yeah. So whoever these people were, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's always kind of neat to think yeah. speculate a little bit, yeah. but what's neat here, Paul, and he, he talks about this in, in the last verse there in 17, he didn't care, you know, what they said about him. You know, yeah. basically say, hey, I, these guys can say whatever they want about me yeah. as long as they preach the gospel yeah. and people get saved. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, let me read that. That's verse 18. And yeah, then, verse 18, he kind of yeah. re, restates that, that idea. Yeah, so let me read that. It says, so this is after Paul just talked about these two groups of people preaching. And then he says, but what does it matter? The important thing that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And he said, yes, I rejoice. So, so yeah, so he's saying, like, if Christ is being yeah. exalted one way or another, yeah. that's what matters. Yeah. So and it, oh, these false, because the false motives of the envy, envy and the ambition, and then it talks about the true. Like, let's talk about that a little bit, though, because I don't want people to get confused where, like, if the motives were wrong, like, it's good in the outcome. Like, if Christ is preached, that's true. But let's yeah. talk about this whole good versus bad motives. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And Well, we'll, we'll talk first in the context of yeah. the yeah, preaching yeah. Christ idea. And I'm sure that, you know, and I don't want to – set myself up as judge here, but I'm sure yeah. there are people today uh, who are preaching Christ out of selfish ambition and ungodly motives. And, and I, I'm not going to mention who I, I don't want to go there because we yeah. really don't know people's hearts. Yeah, uh, we can't. God really. does. And evidently Paul did here. 
as well. God probably, you know, enabled him to know this, you know, through yeah. the power of the Holy Spirit. But, uh, yeah, I think, you know, you should preach the gospel regardless of your, your motives. Yeah. Um, and here's the reason why. Even preachers who preach Christ with uh, bad motives, they do something good. Yeah. Uh, and here's why. You know, when the gospel is preached, even by preachers with sinful motives, uh, people who need Christ can and do get saved. Yeah. And the reason why is because the power isn't in the preacher. The power is in the gospel. Yeah, we and we learned about that Romans 116. 116. Yes, yeah. last week. So, let's talk about motives now generally. I think yeah, yeah. it's always good to do the right thing even though you may not have you know the right motives for doing yeah. that thing. Mm -hmm. But the best thing, remember we talked about the good news and the best good news? Yeah, this is, it's good this is the, the, right best, the yeah. best good thing. <laughs> yeah. The best good thing is to do the right thing with the right motive. I think that's really what God wants yeah. for us. In fact, I will go as far to say that God is more concerned with motives than he is actions. The inside, the heart. Yeah. There's an awesome verse that speaks to this in First Samuel. Whoa, we're going way back. Way back. Every now and then, man, we got to get go back. Go back in history and talk about that Old Testament. Yeah, super important. First Samuel 16, 7. Um, okay. You got it? Yep, I'll read that. So First yeah. Samuel... Chapter 16, 16, verses 7. Verse 7. All right. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can only see the outside. That's why we yeah. look. I don't have that, that, that X-ray God vision to see something. No, <laughs> but, you know, we look at how somebody looks, you know, how somebody acts. Yeah. But this verse says God looks at the heart. Yeah. So here's the bottom line. God is concerned, more concerned about the condition of your heart. When we say heart, you know, we know, you know, we're talking about our inner self our inner yeah. being and the reason that's important is because inside is, is actually where our attitudes and motives are formed absolutely so if our heart's right what's going to happen uh, our actions and our behavior inside out yeah yeah it's going to be right yeah so if god has your heart man he has you he has you. He doesn't have to worry about your actions. He yeah. has your heart. So, so the ideal, what God really wants for, uh, from us, um, is to do the right thing with the right motive. Yeah. And, and what is that? Well, we really need to do the right thing, not because we, just because we should, but because we love God and want to do what pleases him. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, man, our behavior will be right on. Yeah, it will just follow behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll flow out of a heart yes. yeah. that loves God and wants to please him. And I think about, too, like when we when you look at Jesus and a lot of his teachings, man, he's all about the heart and the yeah. inside. Like he takes a lot of these Old Testament, like I know he kind of will, will cite an Old Testament law, like, you know, don't murder, but then he'll say, you know, even if you hate a brother inside with your heart, yeah. you're essentially murdering. So he kind of takes that whole idea and says the inside, the heart, the motive is really, really important. Yeah, he does that several places. There's yeah. two key uh, phrases he uses. This is what you've heard. Mm. This is what I say. Wow. 
and, and exactly right. Yeah. You see, the the whole Jewish thing had turned into ritual, ceremony, all outward. Outward. Everything external. Yeah. Yeah. And Jesus wanted to return it to the inside where it belongs. Now, doing right stuff is is good. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's got to come from the heart. Yeah. So Jesus wants your heart, man. He he wants your inner being. Yeah. Because he knows when he has that. And and the laws yeah. the laws were given by God for the right intention. They people just took it and grabbed so hard onto the actual outward thing that they forgot yeah. what it was meant. And we talked about this before about Jesus really was just his intention was to reveal the true intention of the law by saying, yeah. hey, this is it's not about doing this out here it's about doing that because of this in here yeah like worry about this which i think is so cool because people talk about when jesus you know he came to abolish the law but it's not true he came to fulfill it fulfill it kind of redirecting people's minds on what the true intention was yeah they screwed it all up jesus came Uh, back to show them the way man this is people screwed it up man classic (laughs) Yeah, this is what God wanted all along. And he, I'm going to show you now yeah. how that works. That, that's, you've, that's taken, you've, you've taken what I've given you and you ran oh. with it in the wrong direction. And now I have to wipe your mind almost yeah. what you think of it and take you back to the core. Reboot, man. You had to reboot. Reboot, system. man. <laughs> Just like you before our episode, right? You got yeah. to take the battery out of the computer. Put it back in, and then the computer will start right up, man. Oh, man, we don't want to go there. All right. yeah, I know. I know. So good. So, yeah. so really, at the end of the day, like having the right motive, having a true heart, and, and the right reasoning for doing things is going to produce good behavior. It's oh. all going to just flow together. Yep. So, so, don't yeah. do, so basically do things out of the right intentions and love God and allow that to flow, yep. which is super cool. All right, man, we're nearing the end. So we didn't get the verse 19. Oh, we will man. either maybe we'll do a little bonus episode for that. A little mini one. Um, but yeah, so today was cool. We talked about this idea that Paul just continued to preach the gospel regardless of anything. How that was like super contagious to the people around him. And uh that the gospel message in any circumstance has power to save people which is Man. really cool so this gospel theme is really you know knitted into paul's letter here and i and i know it is knitted into all of his letters but it's cool to kind of unpack that yeah. so let's let's check out the deep question of the week for dr keener let me pull it up here it is from nick Vogelgazang <clears throat> from our church I think he hails from Kempton, Pennsylvania. I don't know if that's original, but recent. All right, so he wrote in. He said, big question, general deep question. He said, why did God wait so long after the fall, so after Adam and Eve sinned, to send Jesus, or even call Abraham to be the father of the people? So why did he, basically, why did he take so long to send Jesus? Yeah. So take a second, look at the timer going. And, Deep uh, breath, because, you know, I got to go fast, hold my, oh, got to hold my yeah, breath yeah. this whole thing. All right, you ready? All right. Ready, go. Hey, it's all about God's plan. All right. God has a plan. He has things worked out, and things will work out according to God's plan. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, <clears throat> when the time had fully come, just the right time, God sent his son. So Jesus showed up at the exact moment that God wanted him to show up. He came to this planet at the appointed time. Boom, time. Look at that. Right on time. He's getting not good, one, man. Not He's one looking. second too soon or too late at the appointed time the 30 second the appointed time. theology in 30 seconds it's amazing <laughs> awesome well if it happened funny to you this week dr keener i have a feeling oh. you can tell us something yeah you know, the week <laughs> you know i'm reading they're opening up 
restaurants. Yeah, yeah. You know, not full openings, soft openings, maybe 25% occupancy. Okay. So, yeah, I was reading about this uh, seafood restaurant. Okay, seafood. And this huge fight broke out there. There were battered fish everywhere. That's the joke, man. Battered fight. I know, I mean, you can explain it for the viewers, I guess. I don't know, what can I tell you? These are dad jokes, where man. Else, where else do you get this? Coffee with Peter, dad joke of the week. Hey don't guys. you love your day job, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, thank you for joining us. We are like super appreciative of you following along. We hope you're enjoying it. Deep questions of the week, send in the coffee with Keener at gmail.com. That way we can uh, continue to push Dr. Keener into his theology for 30 seconds. But thanks for being with us. Have a great week, and we will see you guys later. Peace out. God bless and peace, man. Yeah, man.